Previously, on Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors. Ah, oh, impressive. Not only is he not unconscious anymore, but he seems quite self-aware and cognizant. He's not even high. I want to party with Ace. Hello, citizens of the internet, and welcome back to Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors. When we last left off, our crew finally found the remains of Snake, who unfortunately seems to have died in a fashion similar to the Ninth Man. The first time it wasn't very impactful. A uh, dude was pulling knives on people, seemed like kind of a douche to be honest, but uh, Snake, while a little arrogant, didn't deserve what happened to him, so... Everybody's kind of collecting their thoughts amidst the groaning of the ship at this point. A squeal of tortured metal that evidently makes Junpei's teeth curl. An image that is not only unsettling, but sounds like something that would be churned out by an AI. And not the ones that write stuff nowadays, but circa 2009 when this game came out. Uh, but that is the situation. Let's dive into it. It sounded like the noise a ghost would make. No matter how many times he heard it, he never got used to it. Every time it put him on edge. It didn't help that there was a girl nearby who looked far more like a ghost than any living human should. It was Clover. <laughs> she sat on the edge of the bed, her head drooping listlessly onto her chest. Her eyes were blank and stared across the room at nothing. Her breathing was slow and mechanical. Aside from the rise and fall of her chest, she didn't move. Junpei felt as if even a nudge might cause her to shatter into a thousand pieces. Snake was probably murdered. Chances are he was killed the same way the Ninth Man was. So it seems. Well, with one pivotal difference, I don't th have any delusions that Snake asked somebody to open the door and put him through, like the Ninth Man, which speaks to the interesting condition that there seems to be a team of murderers we're dealing with. Seven lowered his voice, likely in an effort to keep Clover from hearing what he had to say. There were four other people in the room with Junpei and Seven. Ace, Santa, June, and Lotus. Seven looked at each one of them in turn and continued. It's pretty straightforward. Not that hard to figure out how they did it. First, the killers got Snake to authenticate on the red to open door three. Then they shoved him into it. Alone. And waited nine seconds for the door to shut. Once that door shut, it was all over for Snake, but he didn't give up. Yeah, I guess I can't blame him. I mean, fight or flight, but yeah, that really is the end of it for you. He probably knew it wouldn't do him any good, but he probably ran into the shower room looking for the dead. It was a small chance, but it wasn't like he had anything to lose. No, plenty to gain, though. Man, that's a lot of pressure having already seen proof that Zero's not screwing around with these detonators, though. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Not a happy 81 seconds. The detonator is only deactivated if everybody who authenticated when they went in uses the dead. Snake was the only one who went through the door. And then, 81 seconds after he was shoved in, that happened. I see. So that's what you meant by killers, huh? You need at least three people to open one of the numbered doors, including Snake. It wouldn't open for Snake and a single killer. No? Unless there's some convoluted way you could... trick somebody into authenticating. Like, telling them you wanted to test something, and then... No, if you just... There's no way to just, like, leave somebody's number there and then come back later with Snake. 
I guess you could, like, drag somebody over there if they were unconscious, like Ace was. But he didn't knock himself out with the anesthetic until after Snake had gone missing, so there don't really seem to be any possibilities of that nature floating around either. So short of severing somebody's forearm and taking their bracelet, assuming a bracelet that doesn't detect its user's heartbeat, doesn't deactivate when it comes off, is about the only way you could do it by yourself, it seems like. Yeah, that means we're looking at multiple perps here. That's just a really weird sticking point for me, though. Multiple people working together on something like this in an environment when we have, like, no incentive to trust each other. It, it really seems like the sort of situation where the only people who could pull off a setup like that are... Uh, individuals who already know each other before the game started, like me and June, or Snake and Clover, but neither of those are ideal setups. We've been following myself and June the entire course of the game, and no, they didn't do it. And Clover, <laughs> she's Snake's brother, and if she's been acting distraught as an act, she's doing a damn good job of it. Junpei crossed his arms and grunted. Well, just in case, I want to make sure. Let's say you're right. When do you think Snake was killed? The only time that makes any sense where he wouldn't have been in contact with the people from at least his own group, the people behind uh, door five, is when we were all searching for the parts for the red. I mean, I guess only, like, guys like um, Ace and Seven would be able to speak to everything that happened before we met back up, but... There really don't seem like too many other possibilities. When we all split up to look for the parts for the Reds, I think. Yeah. Right after that was when we noticed he was gone. Then that means none of us have alibis. We were all off searching the rooms we'd been assigned, looking for those parts. That's... See, that's too convenient to be a coincidence. That's why it had to have been Zero who took the parts out of the red, it seems like. Hmm. Yeah. That means anybody could be a killer. W wait a minute. What are you talking about? How can you say that so casually? You're implying that one of us is a killer. Well, not just one of us. If I'm right, then at least two of us are murderers. Why don't you calm down a bit, Seven? What are you going to gain by being so suspicious? That's what Zero wants, you know? What? Zero wants? Exactly. This game was set up by Zero, wasn't it? Any game has a winner and loser. Whoever makes it through door nine is a winner, and those who don't are the losers. Yeah, but with the really rigid, self-operating way Zero set the game up, it doesn't feel like he wants people to lose the game through acts of sabotage. Well, I don't know, his whole intention might be to just manipulate us and see how we react. I mean, that's still something more nuanced than, say, just hunting us all most dangerous game style, but... Up until now, he really hasn't done anything to actively interfere with, with the game that I can tell, other than possibly interfering with the Reds, which I guess does seem like him forcing our hands into splitting up and creating opportunity to for us to create mischief for him, so maybe Ace does have a point and Zero's not, just not actively attacking people directly, I don't know. Zero is trying to make us fight against one another for that victory. Then you're saying that Zero is trying to split us up by making us fight each other? But that seems to kind of run counter to the notion that we have a nine hour time limit. If he just wants to make drama and chaos unfold, I don't think putting that kind of restriction on it makes sense. He just 
leave everything open-ended and see how we all deal with each other. I think the reason we have a time limit is to motivate us to actually complete the game. So I don't think you went to all that effort just to... kill us off like this. Yes. That is why we can't let ourselves fall prey to suspicion. We have to trust one another and form a strong bond of friendship. That's a tough sell right after what or after what we just saw. Uh I mean, look where trust and friendship have gotten snake. Honestly, it'd be almost suspicious that you were selling something like that if you hadn't already proven yourself to be so damned heroic, Ace. You might want to be careful not to point a, or to paint, rather, a bullseye on yourself with that kind of attitude. Otherwise, we'll end up ensnared by Zero's manipulations. Then does that mean that the person who killed Snake... Yes. Almost certainly Zero himself. No, like I was saying earlier, I think he just created a an environment where it was easy for us to kill somebody. And the snake was the unlucky victim of chance. But I mean, I can understand why that's the most suspicious figure and that's the conclusion they're drawn to, but it's not something I think I really agree with. If there's anyone we should doubt, it should be Zero. He masterminded this game and kidnapped all of us. Doesn't it seem reasonable that he would have killed Snake as well? Hmm, good question. Junpei hadn't really considered that. If Zero killed Snake, then Zero is on the ship with us. Junpei... Was Zero still on the ship with them? Well... Somebody had to have taken the parts out of the red, and I guess the guys who went through door five got there ahead of us. So I can't prove one of them didn't have a chance to sabotage all of this. But between that and the fact that the game does a really good job operating itself, just with the bracelets being automated and the sensors on the doors, and that frees Zero to move around the ship and well, that frees Zero to move around the ship and do other things, but that does kind of suggest that maybe he is the one that killed Snake. Okay, well, regardless of what Zero's actually doing, I do think he is on the ship with us. Of course he was. That was obvious. But I don't... Zero was somewhere on the ship, but... Junpei had no idea where. Junpei mumbled to himself, lost in thought. Where could Zero be hiding? Actually, there is a, another more meta reason to suspect Zero's on the ship. And that's just that, you know, this is to an extent, a mystery story. And one of the main rules of writing mystery stories is that the culprit has to be hidden somewhere amongst the cast. I don't think they're just gonna create a an antagonist in the final act and try to sell that as a convincing conclusion. But, you know, from their perspective, living through these as real events, I guess that's not a very good argument. Suddenly, everyone went very quiet. The silence was cold and clammy, and Junpei could feel it crawling across his back and around his throat. Again, he heard the ghosting moaning noise. Yeah, the ghostly moaning noise, I think. That's what they meant. And moments later, a person who looked more ghost than human appeared. It was Clover. She looked at the floor as she spoke, and her voice was a cold monotone. I think... I think Zero is... one of us. She's the first person to think of that? 
Honestly, I'm surprised we hadn't brought it up until now, especially with what I was just saying about, you know, the culprit and mystery stories kind of hiding in plain sight. Now that seems like a definite possibility with the automated nonary game setup. Eyes darted from face to face. One of those faces was the face of their jailer. But who? Was he one of them? Yeah, no, that's definitely possible. I don't want to dismiss it as crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, that's possible. Huh? Like Clover said, Zero might be one of us. What are you saying, Jumpy? Didn't you hear what Ace said? Exactly. I said we shouldn't suspect one another for no reason. We shouldn't suspect one another for, like, the sake of not wasting our little remaining time. But... I don't know about all that. No reason. I've got a great reason. And what's that? The bracelets. He held out his left arm. Why are the bombs in our bodies connected to the bracelets? You're all thinking Zero's hiding somewhere watching us, right? If he's doing that, then he could just detonate the bombs by remote control if someone did something they weren't supposed to. It would be a lot more precise and a lot easier, but... That's true for the most part. It'd be a little tricky keeping all of us under surveillance and making... And he'd have to be really conscious of what he was doing to make sure he enforced the rules correctly compared to an automated setup. But the amount of free time he'd have on his hands if the game does run itself completely would be better used to do things like move around the ship or even play the nonary game than it would be to just kick back with a beer and some popcorn and watch us struggle. If that's the case, then why is the bomb set off by the detonator in the bracelet? Huh. You got a point. I'm not done. Try applying the same ideas to the nonary game. All of the puzzles here run all by themselves. In other words, Zero doesn't have to be controlling them for the game to move forward. Why's that? Why would Zero bother to do something like that? Shoot, I'd do that just to avoid the headache. Having to interact with as many as three puzzles while three groups are off doing stuff, and watch camera feeds, and control the bracelets just sounds like too much to handle all at once. I'd rather participate in the nonary game than do all that. Junpei let the question hang in the air and looked at the others. It was Santa who answered. So let's say you and Clover are right. Zero's one of us. If that's the case, then it'd be really hard for him to keep track of all of us or control anything remotely. That's why all the puzzles run by themselves. That's what you're getting at, right? It's not solid proof, but it's definitely one explanation why the game would be set up like this. And hell, if he does turn out to be Snake's killer, it even frees him up to go around hunting us up off, or picking us off most dangerous game style. Even though I'm not really sold on that being his motive. I don't see why you would create an elaborate game like this just to kill us yourself. You want to see the situation do that and see how things play out in a dramatic fashion, you know? Yeah. Junpei nodded. Seven, when we were talking earlier, you said any one of us could be Snake's killer, right? Yeah, something like that. All right, then. I've got a question for you, Ace. You said something like Zero must be the one who killed Snake, right? Yes, something like that. I can't think of any other explanation. So what do we get if we combine those? They fit together pretty well, I think. Something like this. Whoever killed Snake is Zero. Hence, Zero is one of us. I mean... You can combine the two ideas, but I don't know that I agree with the premise that the person who killed Snake is Zero right off the bat. I still don't agree with Ace's suggestion that Zero is the killer. It, it, so far, the only thing I think he's done to actually intervene in the game playing out smoothly is disable the Reds. He'd be the person who knew how to do it. It just makes the most sense to me, even though I don't have any real concrete proof. But I only think he did that to create an environment 
in which we have the opportunity to kill Snake. So while I am inclined to believe that Zero is one of us, I still don't think he's the he's our killer. Seven and Ace's theories aren't mutually exclusive. They actually complement each other pretty well. I suppose that's true, but I'm going to have to go more with Seven's interpretation of events so far. I like his detective work better. At least they do if Zero is one of us. No one spoke. Their faces were grim, but Junpei wasn't sure if they believed him or not. Finally, Lotus spoke up. What were his motives? Oh, motives. I've... It seems to come up a lot in all variety of visual novels for whatever reason. I guess a lot of them do have sort of a mystery theme going on, so that's probably why. But motives are one of the most talked about and I think most overrated aspects of these stories. At the very least, I don't think we know enough concrete information about the situation we're in to try and extrapolate Zero's motives. But as far as understanding what's going on at the moment, they just don't seem that important. They're just a circumstantial piece of the puzzle. His motives? Actually, as a sidebar, uh, the Ace Attorney games are, uh, in particular, really bother me when it comes down to motive. Because you'll spend the entire course of the narrative attempting to establish concrete interpretations of events, testimony, and evidence, only for, almost unfailingly it seems like, some character right at the end to suggest that you don't know their motive for going through all that trouble, even though you have all this... this large body of evidence that suggests it was them and the judge actually taking that argument and getting ready to dismiss the defense's entire case just because you don't have this circumstantial pretext for why they did it i don't know it's just really frustrating and in those games more so than anywhere else but i digress yes isn't that pretty important i don't think so but Whatever. Why would Zero want to hide as one of us? Oh, well, that's because, um... Junpei choked. He hadn't thought of that. And to be honest with himself, he had no idea. I don't know. Lotus sighed. Oh, so much for making a persuasive argument, Junpei. A persuasive argument isn't contingent on having a motive, Edgeworth. In other words, you only had circumstantial evidence. I mean, that's all any of the rest of you are working with is circumstantial evidence, and your ideas aren't any smarter than his. I don't really think that's enough to go on, you know? Et two, seven. Hell, you're the guy who's at back I most have in this argument. You don't believe me? Oh, well. Ah. Guess we'll have to wait until we have more to work with and revisit the issue. Junpei was painfully aware of their eyes on him and their disapproval. He tried to find something else, anything else, to look at. Then, in that horrible silence, they heard a bell begin to ring. It was the clock at the central staircase. It's three in the morning. Oh. So we've wasted... We've wasted three hours and we only have three hours left because we're supposed to sink at six, right? With still needing to find the number nine door and presumably having at least one more set of doors to go through before we can do so, we're on track to not escape the boat at this rate. That means we have three hours left. Then we need to move now. Seven, Clover, Junpei, I know how you feel, but you do understand that right now it's important we trust one another, don't you? If only for the sake of survival, yeah. Let's get to it. You're right, but... Junpei couldn't bring himself to respond. He swallowed the words he wanted to say and sighed. Seven and Clover remained similarly silent. 
Their eyes were looking for somewhere else very far. Or their eyes were looking at something else somewhere very far away. We must go. We have very little time left. Ace's words put their feet to moving. They all knew where they were going. Our next destination is Mercury. Uh, damn. Mercury sounds like a long walk. But maybe you and June should check it out first and then report back to us. All right. Let's go, June. Right. Here it is. But fortunately, the Mercury elevators are pretty close, aren't they? Just right outside the hospital room, really. It sat, bolted to the wall near the stairs that led to the casino and the kitchen, between the two elevators. The Mercury card reader. We're using the card Seven gave us, right? Yeah. I found it when we were checking out the shower room. I think Seven said something like that. Anyway, let's see what happens. Junpei slid the card through the reader. The light on the reader turned green and made a tiny electronic noise. I guess the elevator works now. Maybe that's what Zero's been doing with all his free time running around the ship. Elepa ah, elevator repair. Jumpy, I know it's only the two of us, but let's do our best. All right, but let's not get sidetracked. You remember what happened the last time we were alone in an elevator? What's with you all of a sudden? Well, I'm happy we were put together. Uh, you know it's just for searching e -deck, right? Even so, I'm glad I'm with you. Aw. Yeah, this really has been the Junpei and June run. We've ended up spending pretty much the whole game together. Even when we're not going through doors together, we're investigating alongside each other. Oh. First, we need to find out if the elevator comes up full of water. Just like we did before. Yeah, that would be a diligent decision. Oh, here it is. I knew it. It's not wet at all. Well, I mean, but that doesn't prove anything by itself. Remember, we've been operating under the assumption that the elevator shafts are watertight. So we still need to send it down once so it opens on the lower deck. Let's go. Or we could throw caution to the wind. Worked last time. Yes. Once it had been checked for water, Junpei and June stepped into the elevator. Look! Nearly all of the buttons are destroyed. Oh, okay, they are going to address that last time. When we entered the previous elevator, uh, the uh, narration had said that there were only two buttons, but the actual image on screen showed five. So I guess they are clarifying that Zero's just broken the other buttons. Yeah, only the C and bottom button can be pushed. We're on C deck right now, so the only one we can choose is bottom. It says C deck and bottom deck? You would think it would say E deck instead of bottom. Actually. Given our last elevator conversation, that might just be a pretense for June to twist the conversation into being about who's the bottom in our relationship. Which, uh, I'm just gonna throw out there, it's totally Junpei. Yeah. Well, let's try it out. Junpei hit the bottom button. See? See? He proved it for me. Picked it himself. The door closed. Slowly, they began to move downward. Oh, so this is the bottom deck. Well, unless the bottom deck isn't the E deck, you'd think they'd call it F or something like that. It still doesn't make sense that they'd label it bottom, but uh, I'm thinking too much about little details again. They stepped off and saw that the hallway to their right ended somewhere between 20 and 25 feet from them. I mean, I guess that's a... I couldn't estimate that. I, five feet is a broad margin of error, but I'm a pretty crappy uh, psychic yardstick. The hallway in front of them was a dead end, but not a regular dead end. Hey, over there. Ah. This is a numbered door. The best kind of dead end. One with a door in it. This is the eighth one we found. There were two numbered doors on B deck near the central staircase. 
Then three more in the hospital room for five. There were doors four and three more in the large hospital room. Yeah. Doors three. And the door we found on E deck, and the door Lotus and Santa found on A deck. Okay, yeah. I wasn't quite remembering those. We just found them at the tail end of the last episode. It was a six on the door on E deck, and a one on the door on A deck. Four, five, three, seven, eight, six, one. And now, door two stood in front of Junpei. That means... Do you think the next door we find? Should be. Yeah, I think so. The next one's gonna be door nine. Despite himself, Junpei felt excited. There was something about that excitement that frightened him as well. Yeah, we're getting in the final act of all this, and uh, I don't know, it's a lot of room to go wrong for uh, stuff to go wrong. Finally! I'd have my nerves going too. Yeah. You don't look very happy about it, though. It's not that. I just hope nothing goes wrong. I think everybody's gonna get kind of high strung, and with the number of bracelets we're missing at this point, the combinations we can make to open the nine door are reduced. And that's something I don't think we've really thought about or discussed in any detail yet. So there is some stuff to worry about. You're right. We should keep our fingers crossed. But for now, yeah, let's just move forward. Let's head back. Okay. He did his best to put it from his mind and headed to sea deck with June. One, two, three, four. All right, seven pieces. The pieces of paper they'd folded up lay on the ground next to Junpei's legs. Everyone had written on paper pulled from Junpei's notebook in an effort to pull together a blind vote. Yeah, that would probably save us a lot of arguing. It saves us the trouble of people trying to change their opinion on what door they want in the middle of a conversation just because of what somebody else has said. Just double checking, but everyone wrote their code name and a door number they want, right? Yes, just like you told us earlier. <sighs> Can't believe we're voting here. Not a big believer in democracy there, Seven. It's okay, I think the guys from your anarchist Facebook group will forgive you. We need to make the whole thing fair, blah de blah This is a complicated plan, you know. No, I mean, I think this is just... This is the simplest plan. It saves us the most time and effort in arguing. Hurry it up, Mr. I have a brilliant idea. They decided it wasn't fair to simply ask everyone at once. That would allow people to force others to go through certain doors. Yeah, yeah, quiet in the peanut gallery. Oh, okay, so their logic has more to do with, uh... Not influencing and peer pressuring each other. And he had a plan. It wasn't a plan he wanted anyone catching wind of, however. So he did his best to act calm as he began to open and read the pieces of paper. All right, let's open these up. The first one says, Ace requests door one. Yes, I do. Would you like me to explain why? Uh, probably not in the best interest of time. No, we don't have time for that. Sorry. Let's keep going. Though I'll wonder if we'll regret not hearing that out later. I'm kind of curious. He opened the second one. Next is Santa. He wants door six. Yeah, that's what I wrote. Junpei continued with the third, fourth, and fifth pieces of paper. Clover wants one, Lotus wants two, and Seven also wants two. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, there is no way I'm going anywhere with the Elephant Man. Well, I'm sure the Elephant Man doesn't want to go anywhere with the Snake Woman, but what's done is done. That's the point of the vote. No, there'd be no point to the voting if we let people change their choices because of stuff like that. But, no. Just give it up, Lotus. It's not like I want to hang out with some exhibitionist grandma. <laughs> oh, damn. I am not an exhibitionist. I'm wearing clothes. Barely. Barely. So, <laughs> last I checked, that's not a crime. 
Maybe. But what about common decency? Nobody wants to have to look at a chick who looks like a half-naked raisin. Damn, Seven's not letting up. He's gonna just completely torch Lotus's OnlyFans. Oh, I'm gonna kill you! Lotus's hair flared out like the mane of an angry lion. Oh, not good. And she roared with a voice that shook the walls. Let go! Let go of me! I'm killing him! With some difficulty, Ace managed to restrain her. Junpei, read the rest. <laughs> You're a braver man than me getting in the middle of that, Ace. Uh, right. Junpei tore his eyes away and looked down at the sixth piece of paper. He opened it. June wants door six. Yes, I don't really have a reason. I just felt like it. All of the papers, save Junpei's, had been read. He did some quick calculations in his head. So this was everyone's vote. Ace and Clover requested door one. This was the door on A deck, near the central staircase. Seven and Lotus requested door two. This was the door on the bottom deck and could be reached by taking the elevator to to the bottom of the ship. Santa and June requested door six. This was the door on E deck and could be reached by taking the elevator near the central staircase down. The, the door I should choose is... Oh, let's see. So, Ace and Clover is five. If I add to that, that's a digital root of one. So we could open door one. Seven and Lotus add up to 15, plus five is 20. The digital root of that is two. And Santa and June's numbers are nine, plus five is 14. That's a digital root of five. I can tag along with any group except Santa and June without rearranging the numbers. It took him less than a second to run the numbers. Oh, okay. Really showing me up there, Junpei. It took me at least 15, 20 seconds to discuss all of that just now. He opened the seventh piece of paper and spoke. Okay, the last one is mine. I want to go through. Ah, oh, perks of being the guy pulling all the numbers out of the hat. I can change mine at the last minute as long as I'm sneaky. All uh, right, well, I have pretty much made my peace with door one at this point. So it looks like we're going to be accompanying Ace and Clover. My choice is door one. Santa was unconvinced. Hey, wait a minute there. Uh-oh, did he notice Junpei pulling a fast one? You cheating? Maybe there's a big plot twist and I'm zero. Cheating? I'm asking if you changed your number after you heard what doors we wanted. How could I do that? I wrote it down on the paper earlier. Let me see that. Sure, here. Junpei shrugged and handed it to him. Santa examined it furiously. The others peered at it as well. As they did, Junpei quickly slipped the piece of paper he'd been hiding into his pocket. Although he'd never know it now, Santa had been justified in his suspicions. Junpei had switched papers. I had three pieces of paper ready. Benefits of long sleeves, Santa. For doors one, two, and six. And I put the one with door six on it into the pot. Okay, so I actually had to go to the trouble of changing it at the last second. This plan wouldn't be nearly so effective if you'd had to pick his number in the middle of everybody, though. He put a small mark on it so that he would know which one was his. I just needed to make sure I drew last. Oh, okay, so he even manipulated that. Uh, the order he drew them in to make sure he came at the last second and had all the information to make an informed decision. That's, uh, that's a real 200 IQ move from Junpei there. Kind of came out of nowhere. After I saw everyone else's result, I just chose whatever door I wanted. If the number I'd already put in matched, then I didn't have to switch the paper out. 
Well, what does it say? Ah, oh, he's gonna be all smug about it too. Fighting the urge to smirk. <laughs> you got lucky. Well, nothing lucky about it, actually. Santa snorted and tossed the paper aside, frustrated. Very well. We've decided who will go through door one. Where does that leave us with the remaining two? It will be Clover, Junpei, and myself. Our only problem is the two remaining teams. June and I want door six. Lotus and I want door two. Oh, that's right. There's only seven of us, and if three of us are going into door one, we can't divide up into teams that can open doors two and six, because that would only be two people per team. So I guess everybody else is going to have to come to some sort of consensus on what door to go into together. Actually... That's not good. What is the digital root of the remaining people? Let's see. Calculators here. Ace, Clover, and I are going through door one that left. Santa and June... Uh, seven and Lotus. Okay, so if they all band together, they can get through door six. So we haven't reached a gridlock where we can't proceed, where everybody can't proceed forward or anything. We can't open either of those doors with only two people. No, but we're still in a pretty good position where we don't leave anybody behind. <sighs> Fine. Seven, we'll go through door six. Three plus six plus seven plus eight is twenty-four is two plus four equals six. Why am I reading this? I actually went through the trouble of doing this in the calculator. Sure thing. I didn't really want to go through door two anyway. Besides, if we've got a younger girl with us, it'll lower the average age. <laughs> He's just not giving that up. Right, June? Uh, well, I... I am... Um... She's, uh, I don't think she wants to get in the middle of this. She saw all those scratches Lotus F left on Ace when he did. Doesn't want any part of it. June was lo at a loss for words. Lotus was not. Pig, you just wait and see. <laughs> they go to the trouble of animating her uh, portrait floating by there. As far as I know, the only time in the game they do that. I guess that something about that was just a special moment. Her eyes were the eyes of a woman prepared to kill. A shiver ran down Junpei's spine. Calling me old. This is why men are such a pain in the ass. <laughs> they're about as subtle as a brick. And they're at it again. Honestly, neither one of you are particularly subtle people. In fact, you're kind of made for each other in the most abrasive way possible. Even after they separated at the staircase, Lotus was still muttering angrily to herself. See, that, that's not subtle either. I'll see you later, June. Jumpy. Yeah, this is pretty much the first time we've had to separate since meeting here at this staircase, isn't it? Circumstances dictated that Junpei and Jun would have to part ways again. But this time it didn't sting quite so much. Don't make that face. It'll be like what Seven said. Yeah, we do have two examples now of us all grouping back up after going through the doors. We aren't going to be, be split, split up, permanently up permanently till we find door, door nine. nine. And since we're on the verge of finding door nine, that's all the more true than... That's more true now than it's ever been. We might get, we might separated, get separated for a little while, while but we'll, we'll see, see each other, each other again. again. Otherwise, Otherwise, we won't be able to open open door night. That's, That's how the notary, notary game works. works. Seven's words took a weight off Junpei's shoulders and felt much better. It'll be fine. I'll see you soon. All right. See you later. Lingering uneasiness remained but they went their separate directions without much trouble. Junpei, Ace, and Clover headed toward A-Deck. Here's A-Deck. It was the door on the left, right? Mm. That should be it, yes. Then here we go. 
It opened, and they walked through. It's just as Santa and Lotus said. You know, it doesn't feel like Zero put the same love into painting the one on this door he did with the others. The lines are so clean, there's hardly any of the blood splatter stuff going on. At the end of the hallway sat a door with a large red one upon it. A numbered door. To the left of it, bolted to the wall, was the red. There's the red. I'll go first. Ace went first and waved his wrist over the scanner panel. Now the two of you, if you would. Junpei was next. <clears throat> Finally, listlessly, Clover lifted her arm. She leaned toward the scanner panel. And the third asterisk clicked to life, shining brightly. Ace took hold of the lever. Now. He took a deep breath and turned to Junpei and Clover. Are you ready? Shall I pull it? I know I've uh, pointed out that they ask this every time we open a door, but at least it makes sense when we're going through one of the numbered doors and the bombs are about to be activated. Yeah, anytime. <sighs> Clover said nothing. She nodded. Little more than a lethargic twitch of the head. Very well, then. Three, two, one. And it's open! Move it! They stumbled into the room. Where? Where is it? Frantically, Junpei scanned the room. His eyes stopped on a device on the device that would determine whether they lived or died. Uh, there it is! Over there! Next to the door they'd come through was the dead. As one, they ran to it. They put their hands over it as if they were fighting for it. <laughs> Imagine fighting so hard over who authenticates on the dead first that you don't actually <laughs> activate it in time and kill your entire group. That's, uh, everybody bum-rushing the entrance of a Walmart on Black Friday levels of logic right there. Uh. Uh. It stopped. Yes, it did. Junpei could feel his heart pounding against the inside of his ribs. Ace and Clover were breathing hard and fast. Ooh, I don't believe I'll ever get used to that. I'm not sure it's something I'd want to get used to. We should finish this game before imminent death becomes a normal thing. Well, good thing we have all the exploded bodies to remind us how horrifying it can be, huh guys? Plenty of motivation. <laughs> I agree. Now then. Junpei looked around again, this time more slowly. There's another door. Now this room is sharp looking. And we already went through the first class cabin, so an impressive suite like this must belong to somebody truly important. Let's try opening it. He took hold of the knob and easily, gently, pulled it open. So, this is the wheelhouse? Oh, somebody important indeed. Looks like these are the captain's digs. He closed the door again and turned to Ace and Clover. He fixed each in turn with a meaningful stare, then spoke. Ace, you investigate the wheelhouse next door. Very well. Clover, you're in charge of this room. Uh... Say something! Damn, Junpei's really taking charge after so many of these puzzles. Okay, I will. Might want to take it a little easier on Clover, though. All right then, let's get started. Taking a look at the map here, it, uh... It doesn't seem like there's actually that much to investigate, so I guess things must be really densely packed. Or, no, actually, I think it's just because it's not showing the uh, actual wheelhouse room Ace is busy investigating. 
This is just the room with the two desks, me and Clover, and that that would explain it. Uh, let's see. This is just the door we came through. So, yeah, there's definitely not too much on our end to actually explore. Uh, I guess we'll start here. I think this is a nautical chart. There's this line on it here. I think this line is the route the ship is supposed to take. There are these dots all over the map. Oh, those are probably ports, like, for a boat to stop at. It looks like the lines connect the dots. Okay. I wonder if this reflects the ship this, or the path this ship is taking, or... Maybe a ship one, or a path one of the Titanic or its sister ships took in the course of their lifetime? Because, I, I mean... Planning out a course for a ship that's only going to be afloat for nine hours, plus however long Zero had us knocked out for, seems kind of unnecessary. Uh, it ain't gonna make it to port. There's a stack of charts like that one. Yeah. How many are there? I'm not really sure, but I'd say somewhere in the ballpark of ten or so? Huh. Proof Junpei has trouble counting any higher than about 10. And yet he can rig a democratic election. So I'm guessing that chart corresponds to all the pins that are on this map above the actual desk here. A world map with the Atlantic Ocean in the center. There are a number of red pins in several locations. What do these red pins mean? Well, the nautical charts I picked up earlier have a map like this one. Maybe one of them matches up to the pins or something. Let's see. Well, what do you know? Looks like this one's a match to the pins. Okay, so we've got seven locations connected by straight lines, and each one has a word next to it. That's probably the speed. It shows arrow or it shows directions for of southwest, southwest, northwest, east, north, and straight. And then corresponding to each of those respectively, I assume, are the speeds full, half, slow, full, half, dead, stop. All right, that's a little bit to remember, but nothing too complicated. It's a light. Well, I guess she doesn't really feel like talking. I mean, your pickup lines aren't exactly compelling, Junpei. That was uh, some pretty weak small talk. She's not really paying paying attention to anything, is she? Her mind must be somewhere else. The shelves are lined with books. Let's see what's in this blue one. There's something written on it. Ship's log. Huh. Ship's log, huh? Looks like that gives us even more material for the file screen. A ship's log found in the charts room. The following is written on the last page. We leave soon for a new journey across the sea. After leaving port, we headed south and west. We turned southwest to steer around the continent, then proceeded northwest. We made port, then changed our heading east for a time, and are now heading due north. Soon we will dock in the United Kingdom, the homeland of this vessel. Okay, so really that's just restating what the nautical chart set us in like four times as many words. So nothing too uh, groundbreaking there. It's a wooden box. Maybe a case for letters? 
Hey, Clover, you ever write letters? Nothing. Again, Junpei, you really need to workshop this stuff. I mean, that's better than, hey, how about this light bulb? But still not quite on the level of what about airline food? Okay, uh, what about inside these drawers? We have a lot of options there. The right drawer. Let's have a look. Nothing. Okay, what about the left? Same result. Well, we found a watch in this one in the middle. There's a pocket watch. She sure hasn't been saying much. And she just keeps looking at the floor. She seems kind of sad. Junpei is not the most uh, empathetically intelligent. A pocket watch. And an old one, too. The kind you have to wind. The hands have stopped at 5 minutes, 39 seconds, past 10 o'clock. Huh. I wonder if it's broken. Yeah, I don't feel anything moving when I fiddle with the dial here. Looks like I could move the hands manually, though. I guess there's something to be said for a, wa a watch that has to be wound up. The only one I have has a battery that I think is totally in inaccessible, so... I think I'm out of luck if it actually dies. Not that I really need a watch, but... A voice he hadn't expected startled Junpei from his examination of the pocket watch. Oh, pocket watch. Oh, yeah? Why I take a look at it? I, I wouldn't have expected that. Aren't you supposed to be in the other room, Ace? He spun around to face, find Ace standing in the doorway. Junpei shrugged and handed him the pocket watch. Hey, man. What are you doing over in this room? Oh, I just thought I'd come check up on the two of you. Is there a problem? All that effort striking up a conversation with Clover, and the one I finally managed to rope in is Ace. Uh... Of course there's a problem. Junpei's in here trying to workshop his lame-ass pickup lines, but now everybody's yeah, distracted by your men's hair dye commercial touch of gray looking ass you instead. Us. Now get out of here. We split this stuff up for a reason, all right? But why did I say that? I didn't need to speak to Ace that way. I feel kind of off somehow. Huh. Ace opened his mouth, then took another look at Junpei and shut it again. A small smirk appeared on his face. Oh, ho. I see, of course. Uh, yep. Yeah, you reached the same conclusion I have. He looked Junpei over. Then glanced at Clover. I apologize for the intrusion. Ah, uh, it's fine. Honestly, I should be apologizing for trying to put you in check over well, the issue. best of luck. Ace gave Junpei a knowing pat on the shoulder and left. Ow. Ow. That was a really hard pat on the shoulder, I guess. For no reason he could fathom, Junpei's head began to hurt. Ah, oh, what the hell? Uh, uh, my head. I wonder what's up with Junpei. Why does he feel so strange all of a sudden? A sharp pain in his head. How much time passed? He wasn't sure. But he did notice when Ace strode through the door. Ace, you didn't happen to find any more pain medicine earlier, did you? Because I don't know if it pinched a nerve or what, but man, that pat on the shoulder left me with a wicked migraine. Ah, uh, yes. There was something I wanted to check, if you don't mind. Yeah? What's that? Pardon me. With no warning, Ace slipped his hand into the pocket of Junpei's vest. Hey, what, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Ace just yells titty twister. Well, what are you putting your hand in my pocket for? Stop! <laughs> he reached for Ace's arm. But 
it was already too late. I uh, uh, huh. In the older man's hands were the pieces of paper Junpei had balled up and hidden in his pocket. Just as I thought. You switched them, didn't you, when we voted? Uh... <sighs> well, I can't say that I care. I managed to get through the numbered door I wanted, despite your mischief. Then, why did you... Oh, simple curiosity. I hope you won't think ill of me for it. Ace smiled, gave Junpei a friendly pat on the shoulder, and then turned on his heel and left. Hey, alright, another pat on the shoulder. Maybe this one will get me doubled over with stomach cramps. Hmm. You just check that out over curiosity, huh? No, I don't buy it. You have no way to know Junpei cheated. Well, other than the fact that Santa brought it up, but we dismissed it without any incident. I think he just wanted a pretense to reach into Junpei's pocket. The fact that he happens to be right about Junpei cheating is just a happy coincidence. <sighs> it was a small defeat, but it was a defeat. Junpei had lost the upper hand, and he knew it. He could feel his stomach begin to tense. <sighs> Damn. <laughs> okay, wait. His stomach is tensing up? Because I was just kidding when I suggested that last pat on the shoulder would give him stomach cramps. Can't really examine the chairs. Oh, well, I guess we can that one. Clover isn't talking much. Well, I guess that's understandable. I mean, she's been through a lot. Really, it's more surprising that she's still together enough to talk at all. Yeah, uh, we're going to have to go to another room. I don't think there's anything else to uncover here. Besides, the room literally in charge of navigating the ship is much more interesting. Uh, these drawers are kind of suspicious. This isn't good. So many drawers, but nothing inside of them. A desk. Anything in the drawers? Nope. Okay, nothing there. The hell? Well, steering wheel might be a more appropriate term. Isn't helm specifically the word for steering wheel when you're discussing a ship? I don't know. And then, uh... Okay, a compass. I wasn't sure what that was. It appears to be broken, however. You see? The glass cover has been smashed to pieces. There's another room on the other side of the window. Are we passing through to the other side of that window when we move over here? Because this isn't a, another perspective of the same room, and there's a separate steering wheel for some reason. I don't totally understand that. What about when we investigate this one? Yes, I suppose you could call it a helm. Steering wheel might be more accurate, however. Okay, so really, I just get the same rehash dialogue. Same true of this compass. And what destiny does it point us to? I really hope you don't think that sounded cool. <laughs> so dejected. It's okay, Ace. I thought it was an excellent dramatic reading. Oh, and uh, South, by the way. It, it says our destiny is South. Full, half, slow. Okay, so this controls the speed ship, or the ship's speed. Kind of bugs bunnied myself. An engine order telegraph. They use this on old ships to adjust the speed of the ship. Like the gear shift in a car. 
well, it's a little different. This device doesn't connect directly to the engine. In short, it's a transmitter. The navigation officer uses it to set the speed of the ship, and it sends a signal to the engine. There's a handle on top of it, which can be moved back and forth to... Hold on. Huh? There's no handle. Yeah, just a nub that I assume it connects to. It looks as though it was deliberately removed. Didn't mean to investigate the watch. We really haven't found anything other than the pocket watch, though, and we don't have any means of interacting with the rest of this equipment. I'm not sure what to do next. Well, I haven't investigated this side yet. I wonder which of these doors I came through. I can't interact with that one, so I guess it has to be this. What's this scoreboard looking things deal? What is this? Some kind of display? It looks like a little like an electronic scoreboard. Yeah, right? I imagine it was added recently. Yeah, I suppose it doesn't really fit the uh, turn of the century aesthetic of the rest of the ship. All right, so this must be what the pocket watch is for, unlocking this door somehow. There's some sort of square device embedded in this door. Oh, but it won't let me use the watch. Hmm. Let's see if it... Whoa! Looks like the steering wheel moves. So it would seem. I noticed something else as well. What's that? Well, when you move this wheel, the compass also moves. What do you mean? The ship. It's moving. Ha! <laughs> ha! Tricked you, didn't I? The wheel and the compass must be connected to one another somehow. I guess Junpei's just going to play the straight man to Ace's comedy routine here. Hmm. Do you think that's important? Well, let's try turning it again. Oh, okay. So I must need to imitate the course we know for the ship from the charts. It was... What is it? Something like southeast... Or southwest, southwest... Northwest. I'm not sure. I'd have to pull it back up to actually remember. Uh, the ship's log was kind of complicated. The nautical table had the easiest version of it. Okay, I was right about the first four. Southwest, southwest, northwest. Then east, north, and straight, which I guess just means more north. So let's try that. So I need south. Ah, hell, I stopped it on southeast. South. West. Southwest. Northwest. East, north, straight, right? Okay, I didn't have to go back around again and do north twice like I thought. Oh, okay, that's the handle we need for the uh, engine order telegraph or whatever Ace called it the ship's accelerator. 
stooping so low are you, Zero? I don't know. What was reaching about him doing that? The handle that came off the steering wheel. Hmm. A handle. Okay. So... I guess before I go into this, I need to try and remember what, um... What order this went in. So it was like full, half, slow, full, half, dead, or something? Yeah, and then stop. So that's actually a little easier to remember than the, than the uh, path the ship was traveling. Excellent. That should allow us to op operate the engine order telegraph. Then let's give it a shot. So, full, half, slow, full, half, dead slow, stop. I wonder why we didn't have to use all the little black boxes there. Huh. That's weird. I thought I put in the right speed. Did I mess up? No, I don't think so. Look. Something's happening on the back wall of the wheelhouse. Yeah, you're right. Let's check it out. Okay, something happened to the uh, scoreboard thing. El Paso, a bunch of other places I can't really make out. Okay, so it's more akin to a uh, list of flight times. There's something on the wall that looks like kind of like an arrival board. There are a whole bunch of words on the left side of the display. What the hell is this? They're names of ports across the world. I imagine it's showing us the ship's route. You know, just like the ones you might see on, at an airport. Departing X carrier, X flight, at X time. Like that. Oh, I get it. It does kind of look like those names are all of all the ports along the ship's route. It looks like only one of those has a time, though. The time is on the last line, right? Ten seconds past three o'clock. Okay, since that would represent the ship's destination, maybe... That time is the key to opening the door, and we just need to plug the watch into that little mechanism on it with that time set into it. If so, though, this is a very straightforward puzzle. Really just like one moving part to it. Okay, so 310 was it? Can I interact with my... Or with the watch in my inventory now? A broken pocket watch. I can only move the hands manually. The knob doesn't work. Okay, so it's not letting me program the time in. Maybe I have to examine the door itself, or the mechanism itself. There's some sort of square device embedded in this door. No, I just get the same dialogue about it. Well, shoot, we're back at the point of having investigated just about everything. Huh, this wheel doesn't budge. Feels like there's something keeping it in place. What would be the point of moving it be? I don't know, it worked last time. The ship is stopped. What would be the use of steering it? Yeah, I know, still. Maybe go back to the previous room? But that yields... There's even less to investigate over here. Uh, 
a digital scoreboard, or something like that. On the left side, it's got the names of the ports the ship will be stopping at along its route. The last line says three seconds, or ten seconds past three o'clock. Okay, so not three ten, but ten seconds past three. That must be the estimated time of arrival at the final port. Hmm. Oh, perhaps. Whoa, what's he doing? Excuse me, Junpei. I have to give you another titty twister. I mean, he is reaching for the pocket again. Uh, Ace, uh, that curiosity excuse is going to get kind of suspicious if you keep springing it every time you reach into my pockets, man. Just trust me. Oh god, why does it sound like a dial when he twists Junpei's nipples? That's screwed up. It should be fine now. Well, thanks for giving me the pocket watch back, but you don't need to look so smug about it. Let's see what he... Oh, he moved the hands. Ah, okay. I don't have to interact with the watch, I just need to bumble around the room until Ace solves everything for me. Ten seconds past three o'clock. Ah, so you changed it to match the final arrival time. Ace nodded slowly. You know what to do next, right? Give it a shot. Okay, so let's put the now properly calibrated watch into the door. I keep hitting the uh, A button to select, and it keeps bringing up the inventory. There's some sort of square Im device embedded in this door. Okay, I've got the watch selected. Why is it not working this time? Okay, I have to select the actual um, opening itself. The impression of the watch. Looks like some sort of lock. It's got a weird shaped, shaped indentation to it. Yeah, not like any key I've ever seen. Actually, it's shaped just like this pocket watch I've got. Let's try putting this in here. Huh. I would have thought that you would have put it in with the hands facing out for some reason. Although, I guess that wouldn't really leave it exposed to anything to actually scan the time, so I guess this makes more sense. Yes, it says open now. Ah, don't congratulate me, Ace. You did everything on this one. Nice change of pace, actually. I mostly just had to sit back and relax. Well done, Junpei. Hey, Clover. What? Look, we unlocked the door. Now we can get out of this room. Oh. Well, let's go then. Clover. hallway. And that brings us to the end of another puzzle, which of course means we've reached another good place to catch our breath. Today's episode was surprisingly stress-free for Junpei. Ace dealt him a minor defeat by proving that he rigged the vote, and there was a little arguing, but for the most part we just made progress, no strings attached. Which is good, we really need a winning streak to emerge with only three hours left. Time is still heavily stacked against us at this point, but as long as we maintain this trend of easy puzzles, we also maintain hope of escaping the ship. So, hopefully our momentum holds as we go full bore into the next episode. But, whatever happens, happens. <laughs>